the army, which set off the present crisis with a mutiny that forced out the old prime minister. These are the moments when Ethiopia's kingdom came to an end. In February 1974, the Ethiopian military rose up in revolt. By September, they deposed the Emperor Haile Selassie. It was a coup that brought to an end one of the world's oldest continuous kingdoms. ...gave it its first written constitution. Realizing that times must change, he has decreed constitutional reforms be made, apparently with a view toward making Ethiopia a constitution... Haile Selassie was the last emperor of a dynasty that claimed it could trace its roots back thousands of years. The country is now a democratic republic, but Ethiopians haven't forgotten their kingdom's proud past. In the capital Addis Ababa, this statue of Emperor Menelik II celebrates Ethiopia's long tradition of independence. At a time when much of Africa was being colonized by European powers, Menelik II's army fought off an Italian attempt at conquest. Ever since that famous victory, Ethiopia has been a beacon of self-determination for black people around the world. But I'm here to get back beyond that, to the ancient history. I've got here the Kebra and the Gas, the glory of kings, the story that tells you of all of those kings, those ancient empires. And I want to get behind that and find out exactly what made this country. The book I'm carrying is a modern translation of the most important text in Ethiopian history. The Kebra and the Gast was written in the 13th century it sets out the lineage of Ethiopia's emperors. It makes some grand claims. It says the dynasty began in 950 BC and that the first emperor, Menelik I, was the son of illustrious parents, Solomon, king of Israel, and Queen Makeda, better known as the legendary queen of Sheba. The link to the Old Testament gave a legitimacy to the Ethiopian empire. But is there any truth in it? Is there really a connection between Solomon and Sheba and the Ethiopians? That's what I want to find out. No, no. I can't speak to an emperor, but I do have an audience with Ethiopia's most important spiritual leader, the head of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. As with most ancient kingdoms, the Ethiopian emperors claimed their power came from God. Church and state were inextricably linked. So evidence of the origins of the church might throw some light on the history and origins of the Ethiopian kingdom. Could you tell me something about the history or the origins of the Ethiopian church? 1,000 years before Christianity, Ethiopians have accepted officially the Old Testament order and they have followed for 1,000 years. So we accepted Judaism and then we accepted Christianity. Now it is 3,000 years old altogether. According to the patriarch, Ethiopia's Judeo-Christian tradition does date from the beginning of the Ethiopian kingdom. He says that the faith and the emperors came together. The foundation of this belief lies in the astonishing claim that the very basis of Judaism is actually here in Ethiopia. He tells me that the Ark of the Covenant containing the Ten Commandments was brought here from Jerusalem by Menelik, the son of Solomon. The Ark of the Covenant and the Solomonic descent comes together. The Ark of the Covenant is with us in Ethiopia. Can that really be true? If the Ark is in Ethiopia, it would be powerful evidence of a link between Ethiopia's founding emperor and the people of the Old Testament. But there's a problem. The Ark is deemed so holy a relic 
that no one is allowed to see it. And there's no historical evidence that Menelik I was the son of Solomon and Sheba. Yet faith in this legend is still strong. I want to find out why it endures and discover whether it's true. I'm going to look for continuities that might appear over centuries in religious traditions, in language, and in Ethiopia's old buildings. I want to see if I can connect them to Solomon and to Sheba. My journey would take me from Addis to some of the most important historical sites in Ethiopia, going further and further into the past to see if I can reach the time of the Old Testament. My guide here is Habtar Mumamu. We've come to one of Ethiopia's most important cities, and it's something of a surprise to me. So this is um, the old city? Yeah, this is one of the five main gates of Harad. You know? Right. The legend of Ethiopia's unbroken Judeo-Christian history isn't that straightforward. Harar is a Muslim city. Like a warren. And it confounds my expectations in other ways too. Ethiopia's modern history has been blighted by drought and famine. But in places unaffected by shortages like Harar's market, trade is brisk. Historically, the Ethiopian highlands are one of nature's storehouses. More crop species are found here than in any other part of the continent. Frankincense used in churches and temples for centuries grows wild here. Oh, that's gorgeous. What do I do with this incense? And it smells beautiful as it is, but how do I make it even more powerful? Yes. Uh, fire, and then you put on the fire, and then it smells good for the coffee ceremony. Mm. Thank you very much. Thank you. What should I be saying to her? I'm just. Seconado. I'm a seconado. I'm a seconado. <laughs> and I apologise for being so English about it. For at least 2,000 years, Ethiopians have traded frankincense north to the eastern Mediterranean along with a lively trade in other goods. Coffee was first cultivated here in the 9th century, but it isn't the most popular item for sale. This is chat, this, yes. the, it's the, and it's the stuff that they, uh, they eat. And, and what, is it good for you? Is it, what does it do, the chat? It's very good that it makes you awake. It's just the stimulant. stimulant yeah. It makes you strong. It stimulates you more. It's to make me? Really? <laughs> as well as its secular uses, chat is used here by Muslim mystics to help them on their spiritual journey. But perhaps it's not a surprise that there should be such a strong Muslim population here. After all, it's only a short hop across the Red Sea to Yemen and Saudi Arabia. But what is remarkable is the role the Muslim population played in maintaining Ethiopia's independence, shoring up the relationship between Ethiopian Christianity and royal legitimacy. Back in the 17th century, Ethiopian Muslims made common cause with Ethiopian Christians in a deal brokered by Emperor Fasiladis. I'm heading to his capital to find out more about him and the Ethiopian kingdom he ruled over. I'm traveling to Gonda across Lake Tana on the ancient trade route which avoids the mountains. The unlikely alliance of Christians and Muslims came about as a reaction against foreign interference. During the 16th century, the Portuguese arrived with two purposes in mind. One was to take over the Muslim trade routes. The other was to find a mythical Christian ruler called Prester John. They traveled right down the west coast of Africa in search of him. 
And then when the boat technology improved, they came up the east coast. And it was here, here in Ethiopia, that they thought that they'd found him. Prester John turned out to be a figment of European imagination. Instead, the Portuguese found a real Ethiopian Christian kingdom. And whilst they enjoyed some success in converting the local population to Catholicism, their attempts angered many. A foreign imported version of Christianity united Ethiopian Christian and Muslim alike under the banner of Emperor Fasiladis. They expelled the Portuguese and executed their Jesuit priests. Ethiopian traditions were again free from outside influence. Some seem unchanged to this day. Papyrus canoes like this one have been used here for thousands of years. Could you ask him if he's caught anything today? You are the I know someone, someone. Just one more. So you can buy the fish. You can buy the fish. How much? Yeah. What kind of fish is this? Tilapia. Tilapia. Jillo. Just give him the money. What's that? Thank you very much. Thank you Thank you very much. To the north of Lake Tana lies Gonda, Ethiopia's 17th century capital. It's dominated by an impressive castle. The city was built by Emperor Fasiladas in 1635, the man who brought Christian and Muslim together in common cause. I've arranged to meet the curator here, Getsh Yigso. Hello, sir. Hello, Getsh. Yeah, you're welcome. Lovely to meet you. This is so spectacular. So what, what am I looking at here? You'll see a real African castle. This is really the first place black people who live in a castle. Nepal is in Ghana and in Morocco, in Tunisia. Such castle. This is the first and only castle. The man who built it was determined to defend Ethiopia's independence. Getch tells me that Emperor Fasiladas was a strong leader in control of a significant capital. Oh yeah, because in Uganda at that time there was about 60,000 inhabitants, you can imagine. That was 400 years ago, it's a big town. So, we're able to imagine that he was a Khan and very visionary man, very wise man. That's why he built such an edifice, an impressive castle. Fasiladis wasn't just displaying his power with this building. There are telling clues that he was also asserting his legitimacy by reminding people of the link to King Solomon and the people of the Old Testament. Up here I can see that, that there's a Star of David. Right, right, right. That is the Star of David because the previous Ethiopia kingdoms believed that their families come from the Solomonic descendant. Yes. They're from the same family. Fasiladas was one of them. That's why he put himself. And connection to Solomon, what was that? I mean, is it, is, it a, is it a legend or is this an actual real? This is the real connection. I knew that it would be difficult to separate fact from myth. Here, it seems impossible. Of course, the Star of David is only one hint that the emperors claim to be descended from Solomon. I'm wondering whether there is anything else in this castle that points back to the world of the Old Testament. For me, the best way of getting a real sense of the building is to sit down, just spend a few quiet minutes just sketching. I suspect that Fasiladas may have been more influenced by outsiders than he would have cared to admit. The battlements look Portuguese to me, and the domes look east towards perhaps India. But I can also see what looks like a curious technique. 
in the way the long wooden beams have been used in the stone building. I'm particularly interested in how the architect has used this beam to support the masonry. And it's a wooden beam. It's quite unusual for it to be that long. The beams are necessarily long for its function. My hunch is the design may be a throwback to an earlier time. It's almost like an architectural quote. To see it here in this site where they've absorbed influences from all over the neighboring regions is absolutely fascinating. Details like the beam suggest that while there were some outside influences on the kingdom, local heritage and traditions were fundamental. And the execution of the Portuguese Jesuits shows the emperor's determination to defend the distinctive role of the Ethiopian church. Just as in Western Europe, many of the oldest buildings still standing in Ethiopia are churches. And I feel sure these buildings can tell me about the relationship between the emperors, their faith, and their history. This church was built by Emperor Yasu, a close successor to Fasiladas in the 17th century. This astonishing painting is completely different to anything I've seen in European churches or in missionary churches elsewhere in Africa. I spend so much of my time trying to rationalize and explain beautiful things, but very occasionally I'm just completely knocked sideways by something. And coming in here to this particular church and seeing a lot of the Christian tradition that I was brought up with depicted in a completely new way with a level of intensity that I've never seen before. It's just absolutely astounding. The paintings have been completed on cloth, which has been glued to the mud plaster walls. Emperor Yasu seems to have been reassuring his subjects that he could look after them. He commissioned artists to paint angels on the ceilings as if protecting the worshippers below. It's a stunning example of the individuality that the emperors were so determined to preserve. And I can't help wondering whether other telling traces of the past still survive within Ethiopia's ancient churches. It's Sunday morning and I'm going to a service at a church far into the highlands of East Gondar. Bible passages are being read in Ge'ez, the ancient language of the Ethiopian kingdom. It's related to Arabic and also significantly to Hebrew, the language of the Old Testament and King Solomon himself. Habtamu says that no one speaks it now. For Ethiopians, it's like the Latin Mass. But this isn't the main event. The crowds are outside a cave. And it's this cave that has the real significance here. This place contains beehives, which are regarded as holy by the congregation. That's how they make the tiny from the ceiling of the cave. Okay. Uh, amazing. And that's why it's considered that it is a holy honey because they are in the church. They died in the church. And nobody brought them by themselves. Oh, they came by themselves. And uh, the honey which is taken from this is given to the people that considered that the holy honey. I see.
feeling of people believing in this space. Honey is a staple of Ethiopian religious and everyday life. From the honey, the Ethiopians make a kind of mead, which is called tej. It is both the national drink and the communion wine. This honey is believed to have healing powers, a cure for everything from minor ailments to major ones, like leprosy. Honey has long had a special place in other cultures in Africa and the Middle East. What's unique to Ethiopia is its connection to one of the kingdom's greatest rulers. It's said that a swarm of bees prophesied his future greatness when he was a baby, and that he was named after the bee's humming sound. His name was Lalibela. The city he built, which today bears his name, is a place which has no parallel with anywhere else on Earth. I've traveled east from Gondo. Now I'm heading to one of the most important places in Ethiopian history, Lalibela. This is one of the churches of Lalibela. They've been sculpted out of the mountain, each one carved from solid rock. You get a sense of just what a huge amount of energy it must have taken to excavate this hole and to do it with such incredible precision. Every single one of those angles is just so precise. You can still see the subtle incline of the hill on the roof, but the actual body of the church. And if you designed it, made it in concrete with moulds, you couldn't make it more precise. It's just astonishing. The man responsible for commanding the building of 11 of these incredible structures was Emperor Lalibela. But according to the Kebra Nagast, which was written more than a century after these churches were built, Lalibela was an interloper, a member of a rival dynasty which could not claim Solomonic descent. However, Lalibela claimed God commanded him to build these churches, and in so doing, he attempted to claim legitimacy as an emperor because he was doing God's work. A legend grew over centuries that the buildings were completed at superhuman speed. But recent research by a team of French archaeologists led by Francois-Xavier Fauvel suggests otherwise. The usual story on Lalibela says uh, that, uh, that uh, the, whole, uh, the whole churches were built at the same time, yes. during a very short period of time, um, whether it was three nights four, uh, and three days or 24 years. Yes. But basically this is the same story. And, and now we are starting to, to expand the sequence, yes. uh, and which covers now a number of centuries. Yes. We, have, we have occupations here, human occupation, centuries before the, the 13th century. Yes. And, the, and the architectural program of La Libella develops on two or three centuries, yes. um, from the 12th to the, to, the to the 15th century at least. We can go inside here. There's still a great deal that historians don't know about La Libella. It's unlike any other archaeological site in that it's almost a case of archaeology in reverse. So in that way, it's very, it's, it is not an archaeological site. 
um, and it is and, and you have to 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 wash your mind about all this kind of uh, all this kind of previous um, uh, way of thinking about uh, about architecture and archaeology. Instead of having successive deposits, you have you have just successive removals of um, of uh, of of stone, and instead of having uh, this deposit accumulating and giving you information about the successive uh, occupiers of the place, you have people who the more they removed, the I more, the more they, they erased yes. traces of people that came that, that were here uh, before. The French investigations are expected to go on for at least four years. Emperor Lalabella left an intriguing legacy, one which underlines the uniqueness of his kingdom. It's down here outside, when you don't actually just have the light radiating straight down onto it, that you can begin to see just the intensity of the colour of the rock. And it almost glows. It just blows you away, because it's completely unlike anything I've seen before. And that isn't just in terms of the design, but it's just thinking about what does it take to do something like this? It's a breathtaking display of the Emperor's power to be able to command his people to excavate thousands of tons of rock without any form of mechanization. And it speaks of the cosmopolitanism of this part of Africa at the time. They brought images, influences from all over Christendom and beyond. I look at the influences and I'm just amazed that there's a two-headed eagle that you might see in Constantinople. There's a Star of David, and in the centre of the Star of David is a cross. And in the friezes above the arch are what look like Greek icons. It's an astounding coming together of different cultural influences to create something which certainly aesthetically works, but also sends a signal about this being a new center of religious thinking, a new Jerusalem. This is a scale and quality of architecture on a par with many of the achievements of medieval Europe. And it's fascinating to see this cosmopolitan approach in a place which many medieval Europeans considered the extreme fringe of Christendom. Thousands of pilgrims made the journey here to worship, and 700 years later, they still do. People